Our next speaker uh, is a data artist and software developer at Mapbox. Uh, and before joining Mapbox, he was an artist in residence uh, at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, which is a magical place, uh, and a part of the Google Android team. Uh, and his work uh, has been incredibly influential and, and shown at MoMA and many web and print publications. Uh, and he's particularly interested in using geographic data to understand and improve the pedestrian transit experiences in cities. So please give a warm welcome to Eric Fisher. Um, so yeah, I wish I uh, could talk in general about design like Mike was, but instead I'm going to sort of talk about what I've learned through exhaustive uh, churning through one particular kind of design, which is the uh, making maps out of millions or billions of dots. Um, and uh, I guess the, the first point that I want to talk about is just, you know, why, why make maps out of dots at all? Why is this a thing? Um, and I think that it's kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of a product of the era that we're living in where, you know, we've got zillions of devices out in the world that have GPS and have network. And they're not necessarily, you know, uh, providing data that is meant to be, uh, you know, it's, it's a report of a single event kind of thing. But when you take all of these, all of these location reports that are coming through the network, um, you know, as, as discrete points, you get a pattern out of them eventually if you put them all together. Um, and you know, some of this stuff is kind of straightforwardly transportation related. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, bus tracker data like, like Nextbus. Um, there's uh, data like um, a lot of cities now have uh, GPS, uh, GPS trackers on cabs. So this is a data set of uh, you know, where, where, where taxis were uh, picked, up, picked up passengers in Boston. Um, there's uh, navigation systems that, that have GPS logs. Um, so you know, here's, here's places that people, people drove around in Boston. Um, and then on the other, hand, other side of it, you have like kind of the more explicit, uh, you know, explicitly for the purpose of mapping, but kind of the uh, you know, more on the, on the metadata side of it than, than you know, the map proper. So this is GPS logs that were contributed to make OpenStreetMap. And then you have data from inside OpenStreetMap itself. Like these are these are uh, buildings in the Boston area that have addresses associated with them. So you can see, you know, for some reason, parts of it are are very well mapped with addresses, and parts are not. And who knows what's going on there? But uh, um, and then you also have kind of the um, the data exhaust uh, side of thing, where you know people are people are doing things that kind of have a side effect of having having a, having uh, locations associated with them. So um, I've done a lot of work with uh, with uh, photo location data from from Flickr especially, and so you know here are here are pictures in Boston, here are geotag tweets um, in Boston, um, and you know the patterns are similar but not the same. Um, and then you also have just sort of the the infrastructure kind of stuff that these remote devices can sense. Um, this is uh, uh, phone you know iPhone location data that was that was cached in par as as part of that. Uh, that bug that the iPhone had, where it was where it was storing uh, storing locations in a public file, so you can see kind of where the cell phone networks are. Um, and then there's also the kind of intentionally gathered stuff. This is a Mo Mozilla Location Service map, where they're intentionally having you know anybody who wants to go around and find out where Wi-Fi networks are, um, you know they will they'll record that information and make it uh, make it available through an API. Um, anyway, the thing that the thing that these these all have together is that you've got a little bit of information about a lot of things, um, rather than like you know one big thing that we know a lot about. Um, but if you take all these dots together and put them on a map, then you can see the patterns because you know that's kind of one of the things that people you know people's vision is just really good at. We can we can take dots and we can see the patterns in them a lot better than a computer can. You know we we are good at. We are good at stipples. We are good at half tones, and I don't know why the eye works this way, but it's you know this is a this is a power that human vision has. Um, so I so I'm going to talk mostly about um, sort of the the process of making these things, things that I've that I've learned in the course of doing this over the course of the past few years, and sort of a you know overview of methodology. Um, I used to do a lot of this stuff in kind of a very ad hoc, weird way with, um, uh, you know, gen generating PostScript files, basically, that were just like, you know, draw a circle here, draw a circle here, draw a circle here. And um, there's a lot of problems with this approach. Um, and, you know, it was what I, I was doing it because it was easy rather than because I thought it was a really good idea. 
Um, and I mean, the, the first, first of all, the main, main problem is it only gets you a single, single scale. You know, there's the image rather than, rather than, you know, here's what makes sense for an overview versus here's what makes sense for a close up. Um, there's a lot of trial and error involved because, you know, going into it, I didn't necessarily know like what the right size for the dots were, how the colors would combine or anything like that. So, you know, try things over and over again until they work. Um, and the last part of it makes the trial and error even worse because it's kind of an unoptimized approach. There's no, there's no, uh, you know, efficient use of the, uh, of e efficient storage of the data. It's, you know, just uh, churn through it and make the image and hope that it looked right. And if it didn't look right, churn through it again. You know, just sort of very linear. Uh, you know, the more more dots there are, the slower it's going to be. Um, so the the thing that kind of that finally uh, forced me to to revisit these practices and actually try to do things right was um, was my first project with Mapbox, which uh, was this joint project um, with GNIP, um, which you know is not, has just actually been acquired by Twitter. But at the time they were, um, you know, the ar ar public archive of Tw or you know not I guess not public archive but uh, archive service of Twitter, where you know they they basically had the entire backlog of geotag tweets. And uh, wanted to do a joint project with Mapbox to uh, to uh, make a visualization of different aspects of, of the data that you could get out of there. So there was a there was a, a phone brands one, there was a uh, there was a languages one, and um, and also a, a version of the locals and tourists map that I had done before. Um, and so anyway, this this forced me to actually figure out how to do. Uh, you know, first of all, maps that were meant for the web rather than the static images, and how to make them work at, you know, lots of different scales. Um, and the the things that I learned in the course of doing that, and and things that I've done since then, are embodied basically in this uh, GitHub project that I've that I've got going called Data Maps, um, which is the sort of the the tool set that I have been, you know, using to to make dot maps for the web. Um, and you know it's it's got an encoding side to it where you feed you know you feed data to it and it 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 makes it 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 uh, indexes it into a file. It's got a rendering part um, and it's got a couple of other tools. Um, not the world's greatest user interface, but um, that's where this stuff is. That's what I that's what I've been doing this stuff in. Um, and I guess now I will start talking about just like the the different uh, the different things that I've learned in the course of this, like you know how to uh, why is that showing up? Um, okay, good. Sorry. Um, so um, yeah, the the different just sort of how to how to tune these things to actually make the uh, make the visualizations work. Um, so I guess the, the the first thing that I want to talk about is just is about scale, um, because you know when you're when you're talking about about data that you can either view like you know totally zoomed in, so you're looking at like you know a single city block. Or zoomed out so that you're looking at the entire world. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of different scales to think about. Um, and so, as just like a starting a starting point to uh, to think about, um, I should sorry, I need to mute my phone because it's making noises. Um, um, and you know, there's there's this kind of the you know the this nebulous idea of the human scale. Um, you know, what what is it? You know. Which is you know thrown around in you know all kinds of architectural and urban design kind of terms. You know what is the natural human environment? But as far as you know what as far as web maps are concerned, I think the human scale is kind of zoom level 13, um, which is kind of a ridiculous thing to say, but it's basically the scale where a pixel on the screen is about 50 feet on a side, and that 50 feet on a side is kind of a thing that we experience as people. You know that that size of a pixel is about the size of a building that people live in. It's about the width of a street. And so I think that if we can, make, you know, start off by making things work at Zoom level 13, that that's kind of like, you know, make it work at the at the, you know, basic level of human experience. And so then the other side of it is, you know, if you take that scale, then what do you do with the brightness as as you combine dots? Um, and I'm going to again make the assertion here that if you have something that is kind of, you know, on the scale of of population, <coughs> which a lot of these things are, that you know, this 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 diagram here is explicitly census data. But a lot of these things are, you know, are basically population maps in, in some sense. You know, it's it might be sort of business focused rather than residence focused or something like that. Um, but you know, if you have something that's that's on the order of magnitude of, of population, then you know you want to make the densities work like population does. 
And so in this case, you know, the places on the map where, where you just see the base map are, are places where nobody lives. Um, the places that are kind of mid-tone color are places where there's about four people per building. And then the, uh, the places that are fully, fully bright are the places where there's about 16 people per building. Um, and you know, this is kind of arbitrary categories, but it also you know, kind of corresponds to the, the way that people actually live. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, you know, and I, I determined the, these brightness things by experiment a little bit. So I'm kind of, or originally, I'm, so I'm kind of retroactively uh, rationalizing where these brightnesses came from, but I, I think that it's true. I think this is why, why this brightness range works. Um, the, the one thing that I should, should mention here, you know, I've, instead of saying, you know, zero, four, and 16 um, is kind of a, kind of a weird scale. Um, you know, why isn't it 0, 8, and 16 so that you're having this, this linear range? Um, and, you know, I don't have a great rationalization for that. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's kind of a what, in, in some sense, it's just what does it make, what makes it look good? You know, if you, if you actually make it a linear scale, then there's a lot of places that are really dark on here. Um, you can't, you know, you can't see it very well. Um, on the other hand, I may not have actually gone far enough because I was reading this, this uh, research paper from Stanford that was saying that uh, human visual perception actually perceives cube root of brightness. And so maybe, maybe this all actually should be, should be cube root rather than square root even, that I've, I've made everything still dimmer than it ought to be. Um, I wish I really understood uh, all, these, all these aspects of how vision really works. Um, but uh, hopefully somebody else who really understands vision can uh, can clue me in on how it really ought to be. Um, and one thing that's actually very important about this is that, is that if you do the linear brightness thing and, and you're looking at the, the outer scales, like you know country scale, world scale, you really lose all the rural areas. This is another census map. Um, and you know, the one on the left is, is linear scale. And you basically, you lose everything except the major cities. No, you know, but there's a lot of people who don't live in the major cities too. And um, you know, if you actually want to see kind of the qualitative things rather than just the numbers, then you need to be able to represent those parts too. So the, the one on the right is the, is the square root brightness scale, which you, know, you can see the cities are much more populated than everywhere else, but you can still see what's going on everywhere else too. Um, so going the other direction, um, there's a question, you know, what, should, what should happen to these dots as, as you zoom in? Um, you know, if, you just, if you just zoom the pixels, then it looks like this mess and you can't tell what's going on. Um, and if you're just zooming the size of the dots too, then it's the same kind of problem where, you know, everything is drawing on top of each other. It's, it's too fuzzy. It's too bright. You don't, see, you can't really see any more detail than you could at the, uh, zoomed out version. Um, so kind of the, the way that I've been doing this is instead of having, you know, instead of having a lot of, a lot of dots, um, that overlap, um, I've been taking the approach that as you zoom in, the dots should get bigger, but not enormously bigger, um, so that so that you can see increasing amounts of detail as you zoom in, um, and then make the make the dots individually brighter at the same time, so that they still get a little bit of uh, bonus brightness to them. Um, and then you know the kind of the the opposite thing happens as you zoom out. That if you're uh, if you're keeping the the uh, the land area per dot constant, then yeah, as you zoom out, you basically lose everything because um, the, the density gradient, um, you know, for the for the kind of countrywide scope is so much uh, so much dimmer than uh, than it, than if you're looking, you know, just within a city. Um, and so I so there's also so I also you know do the opposite thing in the other direction. Give a give a brightness bump for each additional zoom level that you go out, so that uh, um, you know so that so that you can still see some places are a lot more there's a lot more populated, a lot more active than others. Um, the 1.6 is I have no theoretical basis for. This is purely determined by experiment um, that of what looks good. Um, I wish I knew what it meant, um, but uh, and so ho hopefully somebody else has a theory for for what that actually means too. Um, and this this text is full is this slide is full of text and probably too much text, um, um, but it's about. Um, Kind of the optimization side of it. Um, the thing that I haven't talked about here um, at all is, you know, the 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 whole billions of dots things is it, it's really really slow to draw billions of dots. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you're if you're drawing, you know, the zoomed in tile where you really want to see every single dot, then that's fine. 
But if you're zooming out to the country, you really don't want to draw every dot because it's just going to take forever to, uh, to render that tile. Um, and so the, the basic um, way of cheating on this is, you know, for each zoom level you go out, basically <coughs> drop, half, drop half the dots and double the brightness um, to compensate. Um, and so, in, you know, you still basically get this get the same picture because the the density, you know, there's still enough dots to compensate as you as you go out that it's still full. But um, but it means that you know by the time you get out to the to the world level, you still have something that's practical to do um, rather than you know trying to churn through every single every single person in the world to draw to draw that to draw that one tile. Um, and the the one the one point two three here is is basically just what you know the just by doing by doing the math on the on the one point six um, from 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 having the having the number of dots um, again no no theoretical basis for it it's just what seemed to work um, and now s to talk more about the the kind of making it work part this is not really a beautiful slide but um, but there's actually um, a lot of Kind of subtle things to get right if you're doing maps for the web in particular, um, because if you're if you're making maps for the web, you're make you're you know you're not making a big single image. You're making individual tiles um, that then have to fit together, um, and so the you know so the, the the edges of the tiles. If you don't if you don't get things right at the edges, you know there will be visible seams and it looks terrible and it's you know, distracting. Um, so, so figuring out what to do with the seams is actually a big pain. Um, the I guess one one aspect of this of this slide is basically showing that um, you know we can't actually draw these round brushes that I've been that I've been acting like uh, these things are made of because you know we don't really we don't really have brushes we have pixels um, and depending on you know where these dots are trying to are located within you know within the subpixel range um, you know you end up drawing somewhere between one and four um, dots of different brightness to sort of approximate what this round brush is trying to look like. Um, and then the other, and the really nasty part is what happens when the, when the, the, the uh, brushes are trying to draw at the edge of the tile. Um, and this is another thing that kind of kills performance that like if you have a brush that sticks over the edge um, you really don't know that there's a brush sticking on from some other tile unless you look at the data from the adjacent tiles too. So there's a whole lot more that you have to look up than you really, you know, really ought to to be able to draw your tile. Um, you know, it's not terrible, but it's it's the the kind of thing that makes it makes it not look terrible. Um, and uh, I I cheat at the this is an, uh, another way that I cheat is at the the levels where there's only where it's basically Pixel scale or smaller um, is that I don't actually look up the adjacent tiles. It's it's good enough if you're just drawing like a single pixel rather than rather than trying to do the the exact detail. Um, but I feel bad about it because it's you know still imprecision. But it, it's another you know sort of the compromise between practicality and uh, and perfection. Um, and I also I, I want to talk a little bit about color. Um, the, just because you know there are a few things that that have come out of this that have really helped me, and the I guess the 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 major thing that I learned is that I ha I kind of had this tendency to draw things that went from black to a color or white to a color, and this actually really doesn't help at all. The the uh, the thing that makes the thing that actually makes these things look really nice and shiny is if you if you actually have the range go from black to white the whole way and have the color in between instead. Um, which um, you know is it's kind of like you know a sepia toned photo or something like that where you know you've you've got kind of a, a color aspect to something that is that is really a black to white range, um, but um, so I, I tend to let things fully saturate to white rather than uh, fully saturate to a color. Um, and the other the other alternative is you can you know you. You can use a really bright color, or really, you know, as as kind of the endpoint where, um, you know, you're you're passing through a fairly dim color. You're going to something bright. The range is still, you know, you're still getting a, a pretty big fraction of the visual range um, is is going to use, and you can and you can see that uh, 
that contrast a lot better. I should have included a slide here that, sh that used gray for the, for the middle instead of, instead of a color because um, it, it really does just, it makes, it, makes, it makes it look a whole lot more obvious that, the, that there's a range to it if, you're, if, you, if you have something that has color in the middle rather than, rather than just gray. Um, and then I also want to talk a little bit about color um, because it, most of these things that I've been showing you here have been um, you know, just a single color for the entire image. But often it's useful to use hue to convey some other property of the thing. I guess the, the census map, uh, the, the national census map had a, uh, had a, a uh, uh, race and ethnicity aspect to it that was using color. Um, but um, the, the, the big image here is, is dots from the, uh, from the locals and tourists map um, and uh, you know, with, uh, with blue for, for photos taken by locals, red for photos by, taken by tourists. And they overlap a lot because it's not like there's totally separate spheres for these things. So you have to make, thing, you have to make it do something sensible when there's, when there's colors in conflict. Um, and so the, the thing that I've been doing that seems to work well for this is to take, you know, put, for when, there, when there's no conflict, you know, use a, a pure, pure, fully saturated hue. Um, and if there is a conflict, then sort of, you know, let them, let them average out to gray, basically. Um, you know, have, have, still, have, still have the intensity that the colors would have, but, you know, don't let them actually saturate so that, so that you can tell that there's, that there's conflict there. Um, and then finally, here is the like you know confessing all of the things that I did wrong um, as part of this. Um, um, data maps has problems, um, and the big one is that d generating tiles dynamically really doesn't scale. Um, you know, there, if you're if you're doing something that is that is a you know web map that's going to be used by millions of people or something like that, it really has to be fast. It really has to be responsive, um, and you can't be generating dynamic bitmaps for every single person who's who's doing one of those requests, um, and the the especially you can't be doing it because the data format that I used ends up um, spreading spreading the data for low zoom levels across the entire file rather than uh, rather than having it in some compact range, um, which means that if you're if you're re if you're doing you know rendering rendering tiles for for the uh, lower zoom levels that include Large areas, you're basically running through the entire, you know, every like, you know, every 32nd uh, or 64th or whatever um, point from the file, but it's spread across the entire thing. So there's no loca no locality. You basic you basically have to have the entire thing in memory for it to be fast, which is <coughs> which is terrible if you have more than one data set to work with. Um, and then the other alternative is to not do things dynamically at all to render static bitmaps. Um, and that's that's also not great because they end up being huge. Because if you want something that's you know zoomable down to the block level or, or or something like that, each additional zoom level that you have doubles the size of the data, and so it just gets enormous. Um, and then kind of the the over you know kind of the the other uh, more conceptual problem with it is that data is better than pictures of data. Um, this is all about you know sending sending down to the client you know here is here is a visual representation of a thing, um, but it's ultimately much better if you can actually you know send send something that is closer to the original data so that there are you know you can do multiple interpretations on it, you can make it you know fully scalable, you can keep the metadata associated with it, um, rather so that it's not just you know here is the one representation so that it's actually um, you know going down and, and you know, let, letting 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 the client side do whatever is appropriate with it. Um, so I think that ultimately the right thing to do is is to uh, and this is sort of the direction that Mapbox has been going in general is to to is we've been working on this this vector tile infrastructure. Um, right now it's mostly it's mostly used for the uh, OpenStreetMap base maps, um, but you can put any sort of data into it, and so. I think that really the right thing to be doing is not to have you know a specialized rendering infrastructure, but to to make uh, TileMill two and the Mapbox vector and the Mapbox vector infrastructure be able to do all of the rendering stuff that I've been talking about in the same way, so that so that all of this stuff can be stored as vectors rather than rasters and pass pass the information, you know, pass the full information all the way down. Um, and you know the the big advantage of doing this is that um, you know, you you don't um, you know you still have to you still have to make 
make tiles at some level. It, you know, it's not just the file that has all the all the data you need in it. But you don't have to render all the way down to like Zoom level 18 or 20 or something like that. You can do you know a fairly a fairly compact version um, that still gets all the data into a small enough form that that then like you know you've got you've got a tile that represents say a neighborhood rather than a block and you can draw the block from that from that neighborhood tile because because all of the data is actually is actually there um, and this is also really good for um, you know for the future of uh, you know, mobile devices, uh, GL-based um, rendering, because then, rather than rather than having these static bitmap images, you've got actual data that you can work with. So, first of all, it's you know smaller to, smaller data to get down to the phone because it's you know just basically a few bytes per 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 point rather than a bunch of pixels. Um, and then also, um, you know, it's it's fully scalable. You don't have to. Restrict yourself to just these web power of two zoom levels. You can you can draw anything you want from it. Um, so that is really all I've got as far as presentation goes. Um, I will be happy to talk about anything else that anybody is interested in hearing about. If there's any questions or anything. <laughs>